So, let's see if the mic is on. Is the mic on? Ah, there you go. Can you guys hear? Oh, there we go. It's like an echo. Hey, so um, I'm Bill Girard. I'm a, a principal engineer at Intel. Um, over the last uh, few years, I've been leading our overall IT app software development. So the perspective you'll hear today really is um, from uh, you know, a, a customer, consumer of cloud technologies and, and really what is our approaches to you really engage our um, app software development team. In, in Intel IT, we have um, almost 3,000 or so applications and, and 1,500 um, app software developers. And so the journey we'll talk about today really is how we've engaged that development team um, you know, try, try to move them off of their old uh, way of doing software development and embrace um, and take advantage of, of cloud technologies and other eff efforts. And with me is Brandon Bowling. Hello. I've you know, been working with Bill for quite a few years, so we're excited to share our journey and our experiences in this effort. Okay, so from a, a context, I think, you know, really at a high level, um, you, you've deployed a, a cloud architecture. Um, you, you find that uh, adoption may not be quite what uh, we expected, um, you know, from an IT organization. How do we engage the developer, really? So the conversation today that we want to have is approaches to engaging the app development teams. What are some of the architecture considerations, some of the enabling capabilities? Um, and so it kind of ranges a, a broad set of topics, and we can... Um, you know, leave some time at the end around, uh, you know, questions and answers. But, you know, fundamentally our goal is to accelerate um, adoption of, of the cloud architecture that we're investing quite heavily in. Um, so um, before we kind of get into what does it mean to do cloud architecture, the harsh reality, at least in the discussions that we've had, is cloud in and of it by itself isn't a compelling enough uh, driver for most enterprise applications to adopt. Um, they're... they're uh, pursuing multiple efforts, and when combined with um, embracing you know, improved user experience, um, security threats, uh, you know, what's going on for analytics, those are all things that all of a sudden become more compelling um, and address it. It's not a single uh, effort that one application that will consume. You have to address the multiple ones. It used to be in um, IT organizations that if you had um, you know, more functionality, lower cost, that you know, that would be, you know, the selection you did. And what we found over the last few years is that user experience drives uh, more uh, purchasing decisions from our end, our users within the organization. Um, that's, you know, quite pervasive. We'll spend more for, um, you know, solutions that work better, even if they may have less functionality. Um, the cloud is real and disruptive. It's really a play for time to market for most um, developers. From a user, it's, you know, pervasive connectivity. Um, so it provides quite an opportunity. Um, security threats are increasing, and there's really just a lot of things that are going out uh, from a um, developer's perspective, a business perspective, to understand, hey, hey how do we adopt um, and respond to the plethora of things that we're being asked to do? Right, and you know, the de developers are taking lots of demands from management, from the end users, and so you know, we have to now address the 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 demands of the end user who wants to work on any device, anywhere, anytime, and so, and then. We have to adopt, you know, new methodologies and best practices to drive, you know, agility and time to market. And in addition, we have now um, the enterprise has embraced open source. You know, at Intel, that was a long time coming. And while it's exciting, um, you can't do it blindly either. You have to spend a lot of time to make sure that you embrace open source in a way that protects, you know, Intel and our employees. Um, and then finally, you know, social is everywhere, um, and we have to address that demand as well. Yeah, you mentioned open source, and it's changed quite a bit. It used to be that, you know, most organizations would look at open source around, hey, who's my, uh, you know, one vendor to go hold me accountable? But it's really pervasive um, in almost everything that's happening in solutions. Um, and, you know, I think what's exciting for developers, for, for us, mm -hmm. is really, you know, the, the pace in which new capabilities get deployed. Um, you know, the things of advantages that we can, you know, deploy from uh, uh, app development perspective, you know, whether it's new libraries, new frameworks, et cetera. Right. So if you put it all together, um, you know, we've come up with a, a strategy that tries to integrate um, different approaches, you know, for our um, app software development teams. Um, you know, fundamentally at a high level, it's, you know, move the back end to the cloud, um, you know, enable the front end to work, um, you know, securely and with a good experience across um, any uh, device or platform, right? The, the bring your own device phenomenon is really shaping um, our thoughts around, hey, how do we enable our users almost immediately? Um, it used to be that 
um, you know, we would um, gain speed and efficiencies by standardizing on one platform. And now it's in fact, you know, slows us down, right? We have to go re refactor that. So embracing some of those open standards and, and get those uh, solutions moving um, really is a, is a key point, right? So back-end cloud, a front-end multi-platform connected through services. Okay, so what does this mean for, you know, a, a program execution? So, um, you know, the, the, we went back and forth, and, and most organizations like to say, hey, go follow a direction and set direction, um, you know, follow mandates. Um, and, and the short answer is we, we try to set goals. We, we try to say, hey, here's the experiences um, that our users are expecting. Um, they expect their um, personal information, their customer information, their design uh, information to be secure. Um, they want it to be uh, intuitive and easy to use. They don't want to go through large sets of, of training classes. And so we've got some efforts to try to measure usability um, through some, uh, you know, uh, usability studies and, and some pretty good science behind uh, some usability uh, statuses. Platform, work on any platform. Um, you know, support different device feature sets, um, you know, and new user interaction models. Uh, while fundamentally landing in the cloud, right? So cloud becomes an enabler for that. Um, and the developer implications are, are also pretty important for those. Yeah, right. So um, in security, you know, we're uplifting and training our software developments. We want them to follow, you know, uh, OWASP uh, security vulnerability practices, integrated code scanning, you know, all of the things that are becoming more important from a software development perspective. Um, design practices around, you know, minimal user clicks and interactions. How do you, you know, support, um, you know, capabilities for um, people that may interact with the solution differently? You know, fundamentally remove any and all OS and browser dependencies that you can. Uh, let them run standard on any uh, framework. Um, and then the list goes on. So part of our approach really is to say, here's the measurements of success um, to, to enable your solutions to work on any platform. And then, um, you know, flow into how do we enable them, which is an important element. So we want to set goals, not mandates, um, and then say, hey, if you can achieve them with other areas, how do we help them achieve those goals? And so we'll probably get into next, really, you know, what are the tools and, and capabilities that we're enabling our own internal uh, development teams to meet these new goals and requirements from an um, end user perspective, from a technology and industry expectation for our users. Um, and so with that, Right, and just to reiterate that, you know, these, we didn't achieve this through mandates, um, and it was end user focused um, first. Which is an important right. cultural distinction. I think if, <laughs> if you mandate to a development team, um, even if it's the right thing to do, uh, mo nine times out of 10, we've seen the developers get really creative and try to move around it. So we try to avoid um, those, you know, mandates because it achieves, it has the opposite effect. Right, right. So. Um, to help enable our developers to do the right thing, you know, we, we arm them with templates, reusable um, code assets. We can bundle some of those um, key functionality into app generators. Um, and then we have supporting websites, you know, where, again, they can get um, help um, when needed. They can get metrics on their, their assets. We can showcase um, um, some of the common reusable code assets that we have and you know, a place where they can go get their questions answered. Um, to, to really drive all of this home, we, we developed a website called IT Developer Zone, which the goal of ITDZ was to provide that one-stop shop for developers. You know, if, if you're a developer and need help doing X, you could go to that website and find out how to do X. Um, and we developed that website using all the best practices, using these new processes and methodologies and, and deploying to the cloud. And then we leveraged that code base as you know, our showcase app to developers that want to see a reference implementation um, of all of our best practices. Okay. Can you talk about uh, at least some of the technologies? I know we went back and forth around <laughs> Hey, you know, do we use a, a rich app framework? Do we use, uh, you know, standard HTML frameworks? And where did we end up with, right. with that showcase in our own learning? So, you know, there is no right or wrong answer when you pick frameworks, you know. Um, depending on your needs, you may pick different frameworks. But for us, um, from a UI, a web development um, framework, we have, we've been using Angular for a couple of years. Um, it's worked well for us. No, it's not perfect. Um, 
But it's important that we, we picked one framework and then provided style guides, and again, these reusable code assets um, that we don't mandate developers to use, but you know, because we don't like to carry around a big stick. What we'd like to do is have those carrots. And just like the open source community, if you provide you know, tools and, that developers want and it adds um, the least friction to get a job done, they're gonna use it. And that's what we found. So we've, we've kind of focused on Angular from a UI perspective. And then on the back end, um, you know, we use Node.js, but if we're doing API development and we want to leverage those same JavaScript skills that we have had to uplift our developers, they, you know, a lot of them weren't JavaScript experts. So since we invested that time and energy to get them trained up in JavaScript, why not use JavaScript to write our services? So we uh, use currently Sales.js as our framework of choice. Again. It's not mandated that they use that. It's not saying that we won't switch to something else later, but it works for us now. And, and it's been evolving with the community. I mean, I mean, initially we didn't have a good graphing component. They've added some JavaScript graphing libraries. Um, I think the um, observation for me is we've made a lot more progress in uh, engaging that development team by enabling them with tools and frameworks versus saying thou shalt use uh, you know, a certain uh, methodology. Correct. Um, yep. So I, I think enabling uh, both through training, uh, best practices, kind of you know drinking your own champagne as you you kind of use those uh, frameworks with the IT developer zone is a, is a good approach for sure. Yep. So um, you know so we talk about enabling the de developers, and we also want to you know make sure our own internal flow hits certain goals. And so we set goals from our own um, you know cloud implementations um, with respect to app development. Um, certainly, the, the first and foremost for both the development team and our users is, is time to market. We've got to increase um, our pace of, of delivery for applications. It's almost notorious um, in, in most IT shops that I talk to with my peers. Really, is you know we need to move faster. And so so pace and agility, and we'll talk about you know moving from you know weeks days to hours, minutes, um, that was important uh, at all levels. Uh, efficiencies um, and cost, right? We, we're, um, as any you know, cost organization is super concerned about cost and efficiencies. Um, we'll share with you some data around how we've improved um, you know, our cost and, and our time to market. Um, and security is super important, and we'll talk about um, security a bit. So those are really the three key pillars that you know, our um, IT you know, business organization is pursuing in addition to what our developers and our um, business stakeholders want to do. So enabling both the business and the developers, I think, is an important element. Um, and so, you know, we do that through self-service. Self-service is super important, um, you, know, uh, you know, both from a, a cloud app platform, you know, database hosting and, and compute. Um, you know, it's interesting, you know, a lot of the times that we talk about, uh, you know, even though they're both the developer and the engineer may be in IT and they may work together, they really don't want to talk to each other. I don't know if you want to. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, developers, they just want to get their job done, and they would like, you know, to get things deployed and have things just work and, and have things work in development just like it does in test and preview. And, and in the past, you know, that hasn't been the smooth um, transition, and working with the system engineers hasn't always been fun. Um, so <laughs> having the self services is, is extremely important. And bridging them so they're on yeah. the same page, both right. from a, a cost efficiencies perspective. Um, so self-service, both for development and engineer, I think is, is super critical. Um, and enabling self-service at every level. Um, and so, um, you know, really, what does that mean for our, our, our platform implementation? So we follow our own guidance, much like we, we have. I mean, we're using, you know, Cloud Foundry. We're using some other capabilities and, and components to enable app developer services. Um, we did find that it's not sufficient just to put it out there and let them adopt it. You know, hey, we've got it available. Why aren't people using it? Um, and so there's more work that we had to do um, to just bring that home. UI interfaces, you know, we, we mentioned the training and the developer. Um, it's running on a stack, and the, the picture you see up on the self server portal really bridges some additional things. We made it even more easy um, to use from our development teams, and it happens to run on the same app framework that we were proposing. 
um, you know, enabling you know, analytics, you know, message queuing. We've done some additional work to you know, auto logging service and, and analytics for usage so that we can understand if its uh, solutions are being adopted. Um, integration um, you know, with single sign-on experience is something we'll talk about in a minute. It was a super big uh, issue for us, our users, uh, from an expectation. But really, you know, we do fundamentally understand that enabling self-service for app development is important. Right, and, and it's not good enough just to have a command line interface. While many developers love to use that, you know, when you have over a thousand developers, you're gonna have all types. You know? And so providing multiple ways to interact with the cloud to get their apps deployed is key um, to the success of you know, cloud. Yeah, and conversely, you would say yeah. if you had only a, a you know, UI interface, that would meet some of your more aggressive DevOps continuous integration teams. Right. Uh, and so both of those are important. Um, and you know, I think the transformation that at least we've seen, we've got developers with you know 1,500 app software developers in our own organization. They're in different stages. Some of them are doing you know large scale ERP implementations. They've been using a certain technology. Some are doing web apps for a long time, but they're you know really tightly coupled web apps. Um, and so those are you know app capabilities that you know moving them over to some of these new modern frameworks is a journey and so you've got to understand where you're having those conversations you're super sharper in their field but not necessarily using the modern technologies right maybe a, a complete microsoft shop using visual studio some using you know eclipse and other frameworks and approaching them and engaging them where they're at um, you know and giving them multiple options um, to go pursue and so speaking of you know the traditional way of building apps you know like, like most good developers, you know, we've been conceptually layering our application architecture for a long time. I mean, the 15 plus years I've been at Intel, for the most part, we've been, you know, we have a UI layer, we have a, a back end layer, and then we have, you know, our, our data layer. However, <laughs> we haven't done such a good job of keeping those separate when we deploy them. Um, We've, we've been, it's just too easy when, when you're dealing with one technology that you can just deploy it as, you know, one application, which, you know, ha has been okay, but that's kind of shielded us from some of the issues that we're going to cover in the next few slides. Um, now, you know, we still have our layers, but we're deploying them separately. And, you know, yes, we're using the cloud, but if we would have been doing proper three-tier development, you know, for the last 10 years, then, maybe we wouldn't have been so surprised when we saw some of these issues that we're gonna cover. Yeah, there's a, a couple of dynamics, in, at least in the software development you know, ecosystem that is helping us along. And we've been pushing service-oriented architecture, multi-layer design, stateless architectures for a long time. And for the most part, they've done the job. Mm -hmm. but like I said, it's easy to cheat, yes. right? You, you know, hey, I gotta cut uh, corners, I'm gonna go put some presentation logic inside of my service. Uh, and all of a sudden, you, you find yourselves, uh, you know, in an area that, um, you know, gets you into trouble. Mm -hmm. um, the, the nice thing is both the cloud architectures kind of force some of the stateless transaction a little bit more, which is uh, good. The app frameworks themselves allow you to go and enforce these types of architectures. And so we're getting a lot more adherence. We used to, you know, go through the architecture governance reviews and say, are you doing X, Y, or Z? Um, by promoting some of the frameworks in the right way, we've been able to accelerate a lot of those uh, things that we've been pushing for quite some time. So because you know, we've mentioned that one of the, the driving forces of some of the changes that we're doing is we need to support multi-platform, multi okay? So we, we decided that we were going to, uh, from a UI perspective, when we're developing our web applications, we were going to leverage you know, standards like HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript, and we weren't going to use our proprietary technologies and, and build solutions that get rendered on the server and then just the HTML push to the browser, which has shielded us from things like cores. Um, you know, I, if, if you're a developer, you've more than likely heard about cores, but you know, if, if a browser is making a request to a service that you don't own, that's not on the same domain as the application running, you're gonna run into a cores issue if the, the service that you're calling isn't cores enabled. And when you're dealing with a large enterprise, you have lots of legacy systems that are not cores enabled. Um, or because you weren't aware of this before because you were doing everything in .NET, um, and so those service calls were, ha were happening on the server and not through the, web, the browser, then you might not have seen this. And this is, 
an easy thing to address, but it was pervasive. I mean, it, it was stopping developers because they're like, what does this mean? Um, so, and then, you know, when you don't control a, a service and you can't, you know, cores enable the service, which is easy, usually just a configuration setting, um, if you're dealing with a legacy, then you're going to have to write a wrapper to, to actually call that service from your service layer instead of through a browser, which, it, again, isn't hard to do. Um, it's just another thing that you have to deal with. And it, again, it happened over and over again, and it's a, it was a common question that we had to deal with. Yeah, so it's part of the common conversation we have with the developers. Hey, you, you've been doing app development, you're doing service development for a long time. Why do you have to consider this? And we yeah. all know about it, right. but it's not ne necessarily in part of their um, normal practices and training them how to do it consistently and it, make it easy with the frameworks themselves. And so it was an interesting thing. So we didn't expect cores to be that big of a uh, consideration because you know everybody knows about cores in the app software, but they just, if you're not yeah. doing it, hey, well, how do I do X, Y, or Z? How do we you know share those practices? And so it's a consideration for sure. Right. So another issue, um, that was a little bit more um, challenging was authentication. Um, when you're an employee at Intel, and if you're using a Windows system, you're used to going into work, logging in, and never typing your username and password ever again, no matter which, how many websites you go to internally. Um, that doesn't really happen when um, you're in the cloud. Um, Yes, we you know, could use Kerberos, but we were unable to do that. Um, and so we're very Windows dependent. So we came up with a, a custom solution that we call a token translation service is basically what it is. Um, we call it ISO, Integrated Single Sign-On. Um, and it, again, it wasn't a, a necessarily clever um, design or a difficult design, but it was absolutely something that stopped applications from landing in our cloud infrastructure for quite some time before this was solved. Yeah, especially when you're running and people say, hey, we, you know, we can you know, support LDAP integration, they can do that cloud native. Yeah. That's not the issue. The issue yeah. is that there's almost no application in most enterprises that don't integrate with other legacy apps. And, and they want that same sign-on experience. And so really the, the catch for most is, Hey, it's not that I couldn't write an own standalone app that can do you know, um, Active Directory and, and authentication into that to give the experience. The problem is I consume three or four or five services perhaps from a different system. And there may be old, they may be SOAP-based systems, they may be you know, RESTful services. Um, we would all like to adopt you know, some of the new authentication OAuth models, but you know, for the most part, at least in our environment and, and people that we've talked to and our peers and other companies, because we can ask them, how are you addressing these types of frameworks? It's really integration with L1. That's really a key tenant um, in enterprise implementations, really understanding what does it mean to integrate with other enterprise systems. Um, and you know, how, how do we consume employee data, sales data, you know, ERP information, et cetera. And so making sure we got that right, um, you know, openly it stopped our development team from embracing our cloud architectures for probably 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not that it's a hard problem. They're saying, hey, I've got my old way of doing it. I can give them, my users a, a seamless experience. I'm not going to move over to a new architecture where these are issues that they're coming in from a flow. And so something not terribly complex, but unknown, right? And so you're really thinking about the full experience through the, the whole framework and how to integrate with those things is important. Right. To, just to give you a, a high level view of, you know, again, it's not a, a hard um, solution that um, what we did was essentially create a, a service and then we had a wrapper that is a module that you can write in whatever language that you need to do. And how the, that this works is um, by a set of HTTP redirects. We do 302 redirects which keeps, um, which keeps the app developer, the UI developer from having to develop anything um, specific for this. Um, the service developer, all they do is add a node module if they're doing node development, and that's it, and they get authentication. So there's no special development needed um, for authentication. And because we use 302 redirects, the, the user, the end user um, in the br browser isn't bounced around within the app you know, as authentication occurs. It just happens behind the scenes. And it, and it is a little performance hit up front, but it is a session token. So once that service um, has issued a uh, token, any subsequent calls to that same service API, 
you will not have to go through this, you know, whatever eight steps um, again. Um, but then, if you're if the web API or web UI is calling multiple services, you take, do take this hit with each of those endpoints. So what happens? The browser says, "Hey, I need um, uh, I need to communicate with the service API." The service API goes, "Nope, you need a token." So the browser uses that information to go get a token. Um, the ISO service then issues a token based on the user, and sends it back to the browser. Browser then resends the request to the service API. The ISO module again intercepts that, goes off to the ISO service, verifies that it's a valid token, and then finally the service sends the response back to the UI. So not, not, not difficult, um, but it's something that you know, it took us a while to um, figure out the right solution given our very specific requirements that our users do, do not want to type in username and password ever. And, and our developers <laughs> want to move fast. Hey, yes, we get yes. this experience on yep. our old, you know, traditional virtual environments. Um, hey, you know, that's just another thing. So doing that for them, right? Remember, time to market is the most important area for that audience. Right. Okay, and then uh, another thing, again, it it's sounds easy and you've probably dealt with it for many, many years, but um, you know, a cloud just emphasizes this notion that, hey, when you're doing um, web UI work, you want to give the user the best experience possible. So you're doing data validation um, on the browser to, to do that. Um, but we don't trust the browser, right? So you have to do that same data validation and data integrity checks at the service layer. And then if you're really concerned, you might also have some of that same stuff at the data layer. So um, when, when we're deploying to the cloud, you know, the, these extra steps, again, if, if you're deploying you know, three tier and handling this before, great. But some, some of our developers were not. So this was another area that was common. So let's talk about you know, some of the results. Really, um, you know, we said, hey, a, a, a time to market and is really super important. We, you know, we set a goal really from uh, you know, weeks, right? Spin up an environment, configure it um, you know, to uh, less than a day. And that's really still too slow. It's really minutes and we're achieving that. Um, you know, we'll talk about you know, our, our number of apps and number of developers. We've got a slide coming up on that. But, but we do find that um, you know, the standardization of the stack not only helps us from a, a time and you know, pre-configuring, on the environment, the developers don't want to have to, you know, set up and configure a new web head, set up and, and do their runtime library. So as much standardization we can move up the stack as we can is a key enabler because that's really the driver uh, in both database and you know app uh, platform services. Uh, and so we are achieving um, uh, you know releases in in less than a day. I know you're often asked uh, to go you know prototype, get something out the door. What's your experience in the in the right? So developers, you know ask, you know, how, how do you do something? And um, it, it's fantastic to be able to use, you know, some of our tools like app generators and templates to quickly, you know, in a, in a minute, spin up a, a template, code out, you know, what they need to see, and then with a command, deploy that to our cloud infrastructure and have them see it live. So they get a live demo, as well as now we can share the code. And so, you know, before that wasn't possible unless you had a server running underneath your desk and you could share it out that way. <laughs> yeah, and you know, the other, or, or you had link to your own uh, desktop and you yeah. go home and then, you know, if you get a broad audience, you yeah. can't get it. You know, the other um, area, and there's a part of it in, our, in the white paper, which you'll see at the end of the um, session, there's a link to a white paper, but um, it's worth mentioning here just because you see the levels of standardization. The security um, findings that we are, are experiencing, you know, legacy code has more vulnerabilities, and so migrating over to these new app frameworks has, you know, fundamentally reduced our overall, um, you know, security risk for those new apps. So the, the apps themselves are um, patched uh, more frequently, they're running on more hardened technologies versus some of the older ones. But also our time to patch and compliance, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, software vulnerabilities, configuration standards, those are areas that, you know, drive risk in our, our currently, you know, unique configured uh, virtual servers. And so, you know, our information security, our engineering team is finding that this framework has allowed them to um, integrate and, and patch the servers, make sure that you've got standard configurations without unique security configuration checkers. And so it also has another benefit 
um, to helping improving the way we manage and operate and, and help secure the environment. And so these levels of standardization and freeing up the you know, ability to misconfigure or have out-of-date software or app um, vulnerabilities you know, really is um, one of our strategies that we're deploying to help improve you know, the security of the solutions that we're deploying within um, our IT environment. So adoption. We, we talked about ma uh, mandates. Um, and, and you know we've had uh, various mandates for uh, different things from our organization. Interesting uh, kind of experiment here. We have not mandated the cloud at all internally, but yet you're seeing. Um, you know this one shows uh, almost 700. It's actually over 800 um, applications deployed in that environment in various stages of design and development. Some of them are small. Some of them are um, larger. And then you see the blue line, which is the number of developers. Uh, it's ones that they're picking up and adopting for that time to market flow. Uh, and so it's an interesting, you know, phenomenon where it says, hey, how do we drive and engage the development teams? Um, you know, our, our execs typically say, hey, go tell them. We'll just tell them. And that works for a little while, and then you see it taper off. And we're just seeing a steady growth of adoption organically. Um, and now we're seeing such value that they're now contemplating, how do we mandate more? And we say, hey, just, you know, enable, you know, set the goals, set the direction. Um, and you engage a lot with the development teams. I mean, what's your experience with getting them on board? You know, again, it's it, you. You provide the carrots. You you make it easy to to land their applications. You enable them to develop their applications quickly, and, and they'll use it. And if they don't use it, you know, you'll know um, because we track with metrics on our reusable code assets. We know which ones are used and which ones aren't. So, you know, it's very much like you know the open source community. Um, you know, developers will will speak loudly, <laughs> very loudly. <laughs> Um, so, you know, the, the other area, um, you know, just from a, a raw savings, I mean, we're pursuing cloud not only for time to market, we've got other benefits, but, you know, what's our own, you know, efficiencies and, and, and you know, cost advantage? And for us, um, you know, the integration with legacy um, um, apps and, and services certainly helps our time to market, but just our raw infrastructure cost management. I mean, we have driven efficiencies in our infrastructure um, over the years. We've done um, our own internal benchmarks and we're constantly asking that question, which ones do we pursue externally? Which ones do we pursue internally? Certainly the SaaS areas, you know, in an IT, a buy versus build, we always want to try to buy the software versus build it. And so that seems to be the area that we look at um, SaaS more often. But in the app development space, you know, the, the pace of, in which we can deliver and just the infrastructure costs, um, you know, we're, you know, almost 2x uh, lower cost than what it would cost us to go externally. Um, and then our pass uh, framework, in addition to that, um, because of the app density and the standardization, we even get more savings. So you'll see, you know, kind of the numbers there. Um, there's, a, you know, more information on that. But, um, you know, we are accountable as an IT organization to really uh, make sure we're driving the right strategies and getting results in, in time, security, cost, efficiencies, and, and then get adoption. So that's been a, uh, you know, really a good story for us um, uh, internally uh, in setting those goals. And so we continue to track it and measure it, and we're now we're adopting um, how do we uh, bring in some more container strategies to enable some of the unique configurations. Um, but these are all areas that uh, you know, we continue to look at and say, how can we do better, right? And our uh, management sees these goals, and then they set higher ones, uh, which is always uh, you know, the way it works, I think. But, right. um, so you know, from a, uh, just a high level, um, you know, our, our cloud deployments you know, really engage by you know, uh, enabling the development teams, engage with the development teams, help them achieve those business goals of, of um, you know, improved user experience, multiple device, uh, you know, support, um, you know, lower cost, how do we do in embedded analytics? Um, how do you respond to those things that, um, you know, all of the um, businesses are responding to? Um, and approach it really from, we're gonna help solve a holistic problem, and cloud is one of the methods that you can do that. Uh, you know, integrate both app and infrastructure strategies. Um, you know, private cloud has accelerated our own um, adoption and use, and we do um, things in multiple areas, but, you know, uh, we brought that essentially um, almost um, exclusively internally from a development perspective. Unless we're doing SaaS externally, those teams, it's the first choice without having to, you know, go catch the sprawl. Um, and drive self-service at all levels. Um, you'll see the link there. Um, you know, really to a more detailed um, explanation of some of the approaches in flow. Um, so if you want more of those, you can look there. Um, but it really is, you know, 
in my experience, the biggest shift. And we've gone from you know, mainframe to client to PC to server, but you're seeing, um, you know, at least in my observation, the big push for security its forcing us to look at old legacy applications that we didn't have before, the new expectations for um, user usability and user experience, um, the bring your own device phenomenon that everybody's bringing their own um, you know, uh, device into it and the pace of browser updates and OS updates is you know, no longer three years, it's you know, one year for a, an operating system and six months for a browser and then there's a bunch of them, not just one. Um, it really is the biggest change, right? Uh, you know, cloud architectures, front-end architectures, um, new expectations for development. It's changing, you know, fundamentally the approaches we have. Um, and so, you know, what would you add from your perspective as a, as a pace of change, as a... I would, you know, just say that absolutely cloud has changed um, how developers, you know, um, can be efficient. And again, as said several times, that you don't do it through mandate. Um, you do it through um, providing those carrots because the developers don't want to be told what to do. They want to just do what they think is the best way to do it. And that has been working for us. Yeah. With that, I think we have time for questions. Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Aniket. I work at Box. Okay. Um, so it was very encouraging and almost expected to see that as you lower the barriers to adoption through reusable core and frameworks, that you will have organic adoption for new development. Can you share your experience, not just for development of new applications, but your adoption of cloud by your legacy applications? Sure. What are you seeing in terms of organizations seeing the benefit of the cloud you know, your business units and then transitioning their workloads onto the cloud? Yeah, it's a good question. So the, the, I think it was on the speaker, but fundamentally, a lot of these really are organic adoption around native cloud. So what does that mean from, you know, perhaps legacy implementations? Um, and so a lot of the strategies that we, we have when we change any architectures, some of them are, um, you know, deployments, a cloud architecture deployment around, you know, migrating and supporting some of the legacy app, but a lot of the New frameworks, and even when we've gone from you know, you know VB and Power Builder and .NET and Java, you know what we find in, in our bigger applications is they move sections of apps, right? They'll move, you know, service enabled. They do some abstracted. They'll do some new um, capabilities to support mobile devices. And so, um, in our own implementation, it's really been staged module deployments that help do a hybrid cloud, right? So the hybrid cloud between, you know, what is cloud native versus legacy, and that's been the typical migration path. There's some teams that have gone a big bang approach. Most teams don't do that. They say, hey, I need to do X, Y, Z, and they do that on the new architectures. Um, and then there's different strategies that would be a broader topic from this one to say, hey, how do we just pick up and replace. And so, you know, do you move the database or just move the app server? So we see the app servers kind of move first and the databases tend to move um, after that. Right, right. Yeah. Good question. How about containers? You, you'd not touch upon that at all, but uh, do you see a lot of movement within the organization? Yeah, I think we do see a lot of interest in containers. Containers have, um, you know, we're using Cloud Foundry for this implementation, but we start to get, you know, um, limitations in some of the implementations we have those frameworks. It meets a lot of our use cases, so there's a lot of adoption on that. And we're looking at containers for some of the unique configurations, right? How do you do the standard templates? The, the things that we're thinking about from a usability perspective with containers is, developers still don't want to provision out and configure their container, right? Even though you could do it with command line and never touch it. And so we're looking at, hey, how do we integrate the best of containers, right, which gives you uniqueness with the best of what, traditional PaaS frameworks and deploying, you know, pre-configured sets of containers that do standard functions and then giving them the ability to, you know, modify and update those. And so we, containers will absolutely be in our, in our strategy. They're, they're, they're emerging already in some areas. Um, but this got us started, and now they're wetting their appetite to say, I needed to do more. Um, and so that's kind of really where we're headed. I would, see, I would see the same type of growth we've seen with just cloud in general in the last 12 months to be the same for containers in the next 12. Mm -hmm. Pro provided yeah. you put the layer yeah. on top, right? You can't yeah. say, hey, you can do it, you know, the system engineer function. Without ever talking to system engineer, they don't want to do that function, right? So they want to be able to um, spin it up, and then if they have to, they want to be able to do it themselves if they want to do some unique stuff. So, yeah. good question. Okay. Uh, 
Implicit in this presentation might be the answer to this question, but did you see a lot of shadow IT prior to this? Uh, we still have shadow IT, let's just be <laughs> And it's one of the things that we say, hey, you know, and, and mandating shadow IT with people who have budgets themselves. So for, you know, shadow IT, for those, it's a term that, hey, IT development, app development outside of the traditional IT funding body. Um, and so we still see that. Um, we, we see a lot less, or we see more of those shadow IT that's existed for a long time coming in because of a time and price. Um, we do find because of the cost price points, you know, our upcharge, we don't, we don't do a, uh, you know, charge back model because it's cheaper than what we could do externally as a company. And so we start to give them the tools, set them the expectations. And so they're driving to that and they're coming to us probably way more than they've ever done before. Right. Is that it from a time perspective? Yep. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it.